Hi, I'm Phil Craig. And I'm Andrew Loney. And together we aim to bring you the most scandalous stories and some of the most scandalous people in history. So thanks for joining us here on the Scandalmongers podcast. Well, we're moving out of the realms of history to really contemporary events now in this particular podcast, aren't we? Well, this this one is uh, both exciting and indeed very modern. I mean, it's a story that hasn't even finished, really. Yeah, yeah. No, no, and I think uh, it's it's a really shocking story, having read the book, uh, and I suspect we'll learn even more shocking things as we talk to him. I think we will too. Before we leap into the subject, shall we do a quick up sum of where we are with our great podcast and maybe repeat yes. our heartfelt, tearful plea for some subscriptions on YouTube? Should we do that? Yes, yes. I mean, we're so close. We just need another 500 and we're in business. We've, we've had a bit about, well, getting on for 200 since we started going on and on about it. Um, for those who haven't heard or seen, um, we, we are getting many thousands of listens to each of these podcasts. and We're attracting adverts and it's all going quite well. And we're quite pleased. But YouTube is a weird organization we've discovered. Um, and it, So even if you don't you, watch us on YouTube, we'd love it if you just go on there and subscribe because that helps us get to a thousand and that would do all sorts of good things for us. It would increase our visibility in various searches and it would mean we could get some small amount of money from the ads. So please, 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 if you like us, if you like us a bit, if you don't like us that much, but you want to help a couple of old hacks, do that. And I think it help, will help us get some coverage because I think we're hoping that some of the newspapers will now begin to review the podcast. Uh, and clearly, the, the the more resources we have, the more we can um, do. And and also, it's worth doing. Uh, it, indeed, indeed. Um, anyway, well, let's give the people what they really want, which is great scandalous content. And my goodness, this story. I mean, it's it's the biggest miscarriage of justice story probably of our lifetime, isn't it, Andrew? Certainly of the last 20 or 30 years. Uh, and I'm just amazed that more people don't know about it. I think apart from Private Eye, who've been beating the drum, the press have really ignored this story. Uh, and hopefully, perhaps by raising, uh, drawing attention to it with our podcast, that maybe that will help them. As you say, the inquiry still goes on. And no one has has actually been held responsible for some pretty terrible things that have happened to people. Indeed. So for those who are not British, and I know we have a lot of listeners in America, um, the British Post Office has a kind of unusual role in the life of this country. Um, it's one of the places where you interact with the state. Traditionally, it's where you obviously you did lots of things to do with postage, but you also got your benefits, maybe your pension, a lot of money changed hands, um, a lot of documents. It's the center of the local community, really. And when the post office goes, you know the community is dead. Yeah, so like with the pub, the church, the post office, they're like the big three in any British community, and there are thousands of them. And to be a postmaster or mistress or a sub-postmaster or mistress is a a very respectable position. It always was, often a position that was occupied by new immigrant families who were trying to make their way in society um, and a source of great pride to people who had that role. And so the story we're going to tell you today is, well, we're going to be joined by Nick Wallace, who... Uh, in a minute, who is the journalist who's done most to expose this story. Um, it's a, what was it, 700 or 800 people prosecuted 700 unfairly? People prosecuted. But many other people whose lives were ruined were investigated. And and I think it's really a really good example of the abuse of power and the way the establishment will cover up things. You know, the innocent victims, the lowly people are uh, can be discarded as long as, as, as the powerful people are protected. Mm. Yes, it's a, very much about that. And also about our love with computers. It, it grows out of the 90s, that first great computer boom, and everybody was putting a lot of faith in them. Um, so but long story short, the, it's a computer system um, that looks after the money. It starts to go wrong. Rather than looking into what's gone wrong, people blame the postmasters and mistresses, and they get investigated and then ruined, sent to prison, their lives turned upside down. And it turns out, guess what? The computer was wrong all along. Um, and I think the amazing thing is that I think many of the people who were prosecuting them knew that. Uh, there have been stories in Computer Weekly about this. Uh, it, they must, there must have been someone saying this is odd. There's so many people suddenly uh, being dishonest. Uh, and uh, that should have flagged up a few things. 
but instead it was much easier to protect the, the computer system because of course that was good for business and it, there were some wider questions about the new the changing post office and its role yes so all in all it's a pretty dismal um uh, portrait of what can go wrong in a really big organization that forgets that the people it employs are its biggest asset rather than its well bottom line or its wretched computer system um yeah. and, so and i think it's a striking story of what a, a good good journalism can do because neil wallace and 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 some others but you know and some good backbench mps fought this case i have to say some mps didn't uh, but I think it's a good case that you can change things. Um, and I think he makes this point himself in his book, and maybe he will when he speaks to us, um, that, that you know, all these things are worth exposing. It's sort of what we're trying to do, too, to bring some disinfectant uh, to some pretty dodgy episodes in our history. Well, well said. Well said, indeed. Um, yes. Well, we should probably go to, go to, go, go to him now, uh, go to Nick, because... Um, yes, do stick with us. It made it sound really depressing. Actually, it's a really exciting story of how a scandal can be exposed and how wrongs can be righted. He's Jesus. a very articulate person. Okay, let's hope he is. Here we go, counting down to our guest. Nick, welcome to our scandal sphere. Well, thank you yeah. for having me. No, uh, it's a great with... story that you've got, and it's really amazing what you've what you've uncovered. Uh, I think it's a story a lot of people won't know much about. So, can you give us a little bit of background to the post office scandal? Yeah, it's all about uh, an IT system which the post office rolled out in 1999 2000 with an idea of completely automating the entire post office network, the back end and the front end. It was called the Horizon System. And as well as looking after postmaster accounts, it was also an electronic point of sale, so a glorified till system. So every transaction that uh, went across the counter, whether it was pensions or benefits going out or stamp uh, monies coming in, was recorded on the Horizon EPOS system and then put into the Horizon accounting system and then transferred to the back end of the post office where uh, it could keep an eye on what was going on. At the time, it was described as the largest non-military uh, IT system in Europe when it was rolled out. And it was an extraordinarily ambitious idea to try and automate 20,000 different post offices around the country with 60,000 users requiring 60,000 terminals in geographically disparate locations with all sorts of connectivity issues. And of course, the uh, abilities of the users, many of whom were in late middle age and who'd never even used a, a computer mouse before, let alone a sort of touchscreen output. But the crucial thing about this IT system wasn't so much that uh, it was ambitious, it was the fact that it took control of the postmaster's accounts out of their own hands. Because uh, postmasters, many people don't know this, are actually self-employed business people. They are agents of the post office and they are responsible for the money coming into their branch, the public money coming into their branch uh, and the money going out of it. And they used to account for this in the old fashioned way by writing out spreadsheets, which uh, they would sign up and, and, and put a ledger of every single thing that they sold or, or they doled out over the course of a week, fold it up on a big piece of paper and send it off to the uh, post office headquarters, financial headquarters in Chesterfield. And they would sign it. And their signature was their legally binding um, de declaration that these accounts were accurate. What happened when Horizon came in was that Horizon would tally up all the transactions itself and present those accounts to the sub postmaster for electronic signature. So although the Horizon computer system was doing the calculation of the accounts, uh, it was the postmaster who was legally responsible for them. Mm. And the problem was the Horizon computer system didn't work. It was fundamentally flawed. It had so many glitches and errors and bugs in its cash accounting program, which was the thing that did the adding up. It was unreliable and it would often present huge discrepancies in accounts which postmasters had no idea how they could have happened and which were generally inexplicable because the people at the back end also didn't know how they'd happened. Yet the postmasters were held legally responsible for them. And if was they there, couldn't... Was there a reason, make... sorry to jump in, because this is fascinating. Hmm. Was there a reason that this was introduced? Had there been a problem, for example, with fraud in the past? Yeah, I mean, yeah. I mean, money was leaking out of the post office network. Uh, public money was going missing. It was a significant problem. Benefit fraud was a big problem in the 90s, and that was one of the reasons why 
uh, the computer system was uh, tendered. But don't forget, this was the sort of the gold rush era of the internet. This was when everyone was racing to digitization. And even many sub postmasters agreed that pen and paper accounting in the late 90s was just not going to wash. And so there was a, a genuine desire on all sides, government, post office, the National Federation of Sub Postmasters, postmasters themselves, to, to automate the system. The, the problem was the, the system was badly tendered. It didn't have the right spec when it was tendered. It was appallingly put together. And we've been hearing in the recent statutory inquiry just how bad uh, the code writing and the uh, the project management of the Horizon system was. And it got to the point that the that, that, that Fujitsu, uh, who designed, built and operated the Horizon system for the post office, they were the ones who were chosen in the PFI tender, were just trying to push this really dodgy product out of the door giving all sorts of assurances to the post office that it was fit for purpose, when we now know it patently wasn't. And unfortunately, the only voice that wasn't at the table when these decisions were being made was that of the sub postmasters, the people who were yeah. legally responsible for the, uh, the generation of these Horizon accounts. And, it, and because there was such a lack of knowledge within the post office as to um, how IT could or should work or could or should fail, and because there was a historic distrust of sub postmasters within the post office, because in the olden days, as I say, postmasters were entirely legally responsible for every single bit of public money that went in and out of their branch. What that meant from the post office's perspective was that they were sending tens of thousands of pounds a week to individual branches. And at the moment it went through their doors, they lost sight of that money. And they had to rely completely on the signature of the individual sub postmasters in 20,000 branches around the country to trust them as to where that public money was going. Now, money was leaking out of the system. Customer fraud, uh, particularly benefit fraud, was a huge problem. You also potentially had light fingered assistants. You may have had one or two dodgy sub postmasters. But as far as the post office was concerned, the new Horizon system would open a window, it would shine a light onto what was happening inside the branches. And when these huge discrepancies started appearing in sub postmasters accounts, the post office didn't think, maybe we've got something wrong with this brand new IT system. They thought, aha, we are now seeing this fraudulent activity in real time, right. and we're catching <clears throat> them red handed. So they were they actually, the they were sort of half primed to look for crime. And they thought this oh, great, it was, it was, shiny it was, tool would help them catch This me. post office scandal is as much a, a cultural issue as it is an IT issue. That's so it, and, I thought the, and this goes back to the 19th century. This goes back to when the post office was forced to take on uh, shopkeepers and people in trade as sub postmasters because of the expansion of the railways and, ex and the expansion of the post office itself. The post office could not simply cope with the amount of business it was generating. So it was forced to allow lower middle class people into the post office to become postmasters or sub postmasters. And the sub postmasters themselves, they saw being part of the post office as a way of social climbing. They weren't just po they weren't just running a stationary shop anymore. They could be, call themselves a sub postmaster. They had public office and therefore they would move up in the world socially that way. But the post office never quite trusted these right. uh, vaultingly ambitious lower middle class shopkeepers who wanted a piece of their action and saw them as potentially dodgy. And that cultural loathing of such an important facet of their network continued right until the present day. Darling. And that suspicion was baked in over a hundred over hundred years. And I think you make the point that actually a lot of these middle managers were not very competent. They, they'd sort of been promoted uh, 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 and so no one really understood the whole system. Um, as you say, they were looking in a sense for problems. Well, the, the culture of the post office is that you're in it for life. The, the number of people that I've seen speak on behalf of the post office at middle and senior management level who started either as counter clerks or, or as posties is staggering. And so that loyalty to the brand and to the business counted for more than expertise or skills. And people from outside the business was, was simply not tolerated or trusted. And, and, and that was a huge problem, even as late as 2012, when Paula Venels came in and tried to change the culture a bit by bringing some new blood in from, from outside the system. So you have these people whose cultural identity is entirely bound up with the post office and the concept of the post office being good, being noble defenders of the public public money, the Queen's money. 
And so they had a, a righteousness about the way they went after sub postmasters who had holes in their accounts and who couldn't do anything about them. They felt that they had spotted these sub postmasters, these criminals with their hands in the till and that they needed to be punished in order to defend the righteousness of the post office brand. It's actually, we tend to, a lot of the stories we've done have been about abusers of power, but it's, it's, it's almost like the old fashioned British class system in many of these stories. It's like the knobs and the snobs coming down on ordinary people. This is a slightly different kind of very 1990s, maybe 21st century, middle management computer says no, techno obsessed form of abuse, which, I mean, the word Kafkaesque is, uh, is, is used to, perhaps too freely, but reading your book, is, which I do so recommend to everybody who's listening to this, it is truly Kafkaesque the situation these people find themselves in. Perhaps we should jump ahead to when you get involved, though, because you, know, you are a player in this story. When did you first hear about the problems and try to do something about it? Well, I was working for BBC Surrey as their breakfast show presenter, and I'd come from Radio One, uh, which was very um, technologically astute and very on top of what young people were doing. And the big thing that young people were doing was social media. And I came to BBC Surrey telling them that they, they had to set up a Twitter account because Twitter was going to be the next big thing. And then so this is what, 2010, 2011? 20. 28, I went, no, 29, sorry, I went to um, BBC Surrey and I set up the BBC Surrey Twitter account and I, I would jealously guard it and, <laughs> uh, and, and, and look at every message that came in and try to generate an audience that way. The local radio audience is much older than the, the audience that we get for Radio 1, so it, it was taking some time. But people were using it and people were finding the, the BBC Surrey uh, handle. And uh, we got a message through one day from an organisation called Surrey Cars asking if they could bid for the BBC Surrey cab account, which immediately made me laugh because anyone who knows anything about local radio will know that we don't even have a, a budget for paper clips, <laughs> let alone taxis. So if we did have a cab account, I just would have forwarded the tweets of management and thought no more about it. But because we didn't, I sort of said something rather cheeky or facetious, like, well, it depends whether your drivers will come in and tell us any of their great stories. And the response I got was, oh, I've got a story, all right. Call me after your show. So we swapped numbers privately and uh, I gave Surrey Cars a call and Surrey Cars was one man called Davinda Misra. And he told me over the course of a, a, a very tearful 40 minute phone call that his pregnant wife, a sub postmaster at West Byfleet Post Office, had been thrown in prison for a crime that she didn't commit. So uh, I listened to his story and asked him all the relevant questions. And one of the key things that he told me was that this was not an isolated example. There was an organisation called the Justice for Sub Postmasters Alliance, which had been set up the, the previous year, uh, which, uh, you know, all I had to do was go and speak to the founder of the JFSA, Alan Bates, and he would tell me that there were many more people around the country suffering from the same thing. And there was already information in the public domain about this because Computer Weekly, uh, under the um, uh, Tony Collins was the editor at the time, and he had uh, charged a young journalist called Rebecca Thompson to look into this story. She'd spent a year working on uh, an investigation into just this uh, problem. The, the post office had a dodgy IT system called Horizon, which was creating discrepancies, and it was taking postmasters to court over these discrepancies for criminal offences. She had, I think, seven case studies uh, in her article. But Davinda and Seema's case was when I spoke to him, she'd only been put in prison the, the week previously and she was she was someone new and, and, and for some for a woman to be thrown in prison whilst pregnant um, was was very unusual. Um, and so I wanted to find out more and I was very much helped by the fact I could have a conversation with Alan Bates who said, oh, yes, you know, this has been happening for years. Here are some examples. Here are some more people you can speak to. And the fact that there was already an investigation in in the public domain. So, although I I, I stumbled across a, a really egregious example of what had been going on, the story was already in the public domain when I picked it up, and it very much helped me when it came to pitching it to the BBC to say, look, I, you know, I really think we ought to look into this. And my boss uh, said, well, look, go down to BBC South, where Inside Out South make their uh, have an investigative um, journalist strand. And I worked for a, a fearsome but brilliant editor called Jane French, who um, very kindly, when I laid out the pitch to her, said, well, this sounds interesting. I'll put my two best producers on it. If it checks out, you can front the resulting film. And so in early 2011, we put uh, a 10 minute film out and the presenter of the show forwarded me the response that he got. He got 
I think seven or eight emails from sub postmasters saying this happened to me, which was extraordinary. We'd found three case studies in our area, one of whom was in Rebecca Thompson's original investigation, one of whom had come to light through the local MP, James R. Buthnot, who became one of the leading lights in campaigning for sub postmasters. Um, but then to get this response from other people in the south of England going, I, I was sacked, I was prosecuted over discrepancies in my account, made me think that I was sitting on something potentially huge because. I mean, Every before time, that, were you suspicious? In publicity. Were you in any way sceptical? Did you think perhaps this woman was guilty? But, you know, fraud yeah, of course happened. I, yeah, of course I was, yeah. I mean, you know, you, you get spun yarns all the time by people as a journalist. And, and your job as a journalist is, is to use every skill that you've got to check out what is, what is being said to you. I mean, it may be that people, when they tell you stories, genuinely believe that they are true. And you have to go and do... do the legwork yourself and and so you do a triage whenever anyone approaches you with a story as to how interesting it might be um whether or not the person is telling you the truth on the face of it uh whether they believe they're telling you the truth and if they are what documentary evidence they've got to back it up and then you just go and do the legwork on it and that's what uh, i did and that's what the, the producers at inside out south did for three months we we just kept stress testing the story, um, Fantastic. and and the, you know the basic option was I, either these people are lying, uh, or this is huge, right? And, and, and then you get you, this you wave just, of what you get this wave of new cases. You must have thought, yeah, the wave of new cases was wow. fascinating. So I I thought, okay, um, I'll put up the uh, ten minute film on my personal blog because there was no other way of putting it up anywhere in in, in those days. Uh, I then transcribed the um, the entire. Uh, or I think we had a transcript, which I then published as well. And the blog started attracting more people saying, oh, this has happened to me as well. So I thought, well, th this deserves more than a 10 minute film on um, BBC local television. I tried to get some um, internal traction on it within the BBC without much joy. But I was a big subscriber to Private Eye and I've been reading it since I was a kid. And I just thought, well, Private Eye have spent most of the noughties documenting terrible government sponsored IT disasters. This should be right up their alley. And uh, my first email didn't didn't get anywhere. And then I sent another email. It was just to the generic strobes at privateyemagazine.co.uk. And I, was, I wasn't expecting much. But I did get a response to my second email from a chap called Richard Brooks, who uh, was the editor of the In the Back column. And he said, look, this, this sounds really interesting. Can you just send me everything you've got? So we had a couple of phone calls. And he did his own uh, research and work on it. And the first Private Eye piece was published in September 2011. And so that was the beginning of their interest in this story, which they've continued to this day. So uh, the fact that Private Eye were, were, were banging on about it, I thought would kickstart some interest amongst the broadsheet newspapers. Didn't really. And it wasn't until... Things Why was that? On. I don't Sorry know to what, that's, a, that's a great question. I, re I really still to this day don't know. I mean, the Daily Telegraph did do one piece on it. Um, the Daily Mail in 2014, again, I, I spoke to Neil Tweedy uh, before he wrote it, and he wrote a fantastic piece in which he basically summed up in the way that you know tabloid journalists can do brilliantly they did the pithy turn of phrase. He says, this looks like it could be one of the most widespread miscarriages of justice this century. And it it was when I read that, I thought, oh, yeah, that's 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 what this is potentially looking like. Because as a BBC journalist, you, you know, you can't really say things like that. You just have to go on what 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 other people are saying. But to see a, a journalist summarize it in that way really um, helped me un understand or conceptualize what, what I might be looking at. It's it's so easy with retrospect to go. Of course, this was a disaster that was going to come out. Of course, this was a massive miscarriage of justice. But at the time, you don't know what you're looking at. You, mm -hmm. you simply have no idea. We had blanket denials from the post office and Fujitsu that anything was wrong with their system. They would point to the criminal justice system, say many of these people pleaded guilty to these crimes, and those that didn't were convicted in a, a criminal court by a jury. So, you know, the criminal justice system is backing up essentially what we're saying. All you've got is a few people who are uh, maybe um, trying to pull the wool over your eyes, uh, who, have, who have been through all the processes, all the checks and balances, and been found wanting. And yet the MPs and the campaigners just came across, I mean, particularly the, the sub postmaster campaigners, just came across as truly diligent people who had absolutely unblemished records, who were put in impossible contractual position by their employer, and then chased through the criminal courts to their utter destitution. So, so why did some, I'm sure some of our listeners will still be a little bit sceptical. Why, yeah. why did some plead guilty? 
well this this is the kafkaesque bind that people found themselves in and and actually it was it's worse than that because i think there was an element of um perverting the course, course of justice that was going on within the post office to, to to force that that outcome let's say you run a post office you are legally responsible for your accounts and uh you have a thousand pound hole in your accounts at the end of the week you are contractually li liable under the terms of your contract to make that good there is no you have no right to investigation from the post office um, if you do not pay that £1,000, the post office will start debt recovery proceedings against you. So you think, oh, well, I can't explain this. I'm going to have to go back and look at my processes. I'm going to have to go back and look at what my assistants are doing. Your assistant might be your partner as well, which starts to breed suspicion and, and, and ruin marriages as well. Um, I don't know where this £1,000 has gone missing, but it's my responsibility. I'll take £1,000 out of the retail till and stick it in there. Next week, you're another £1,000 down. You're contractually liable to make that good. You haven't got a thousand pounds in your retail till. So you reach into your savings and you take a thousand pounds out of your savings and you make it good and you sign it off. Next time you're another thousand pounds down. You're getting no help from the post office as to, to why this thousand pounds might be coming up on a weekly basis. The post office are just saying, look, look at your assistants, look at your processes. This is your responsibility. You've got to make it good. Eventually you run out of money. Then you have the situation whereby if you don't make good your accounts, you're not allowed to open for business the next day. So the sensible thing to do in retrospect, and I spoke to so many po sub postmasters about this, would be to bring the shutters down on the counter and say to the post office, we are not going any further. I am not opening for business until you come and find out what's happening to my accounts. And some people did do that. And of course, with a, sh a closed post office causes a problem for the post office. And on that occasion, they, they would often send the auditors in and, and do whatever they could to get the post office reopened. That didn't necessarily work for the, for the sub postmaster because sometimes the, the auditors would come in and say, oh, well, there's a massive discrepancy here. We need to suspend and sack this person. But if you shut your post office, you're in breach of terms of contract and you risk losing your post office. So you start to get into a catch-22 situation, whereas if you stop trading and say, look, we need to sort this out, you're in breach of contract. But if you don't make good the discrepancy, you're also in breach of contract. And some desperate sub postmasters who wanted to keep trading, wanted to keep open because that was the only way they were going to get the income in in order to be able to, to try and deal with these holes in their accounts, would sign off accounts as being correct when they knew that they weren't. So the post office, the, the, the Horizon computer system would say, you have £10,000 in your till, you know, £10,000 worth of stock and cash in your till and in your safe. And they only had £9,000 because they had this £1,000 hole that they couldn't make good. So they'd go, yeah, I've got the £10,000 in the hope that a transaction correction would come down the line or that they'd find the source of the discrepancy or that they'd be able to next week get the money from the retail or their savings and make it good the next week or that the discrepancy next week wouldn't be as big. Or they might even have a surplus the following week. The stress you know, this, of that must how, have been terrible. This is how the, the lack of control that they had over their own finances. and they. The post office did two awful things. The first one was they told sub postmasters having problems with their horizon system that they were the only ones. Now that's never been found written down, but it has been echoed in witness statements by so many sub postmasters that it must have been policy to tell this individual stage, sub postmasters, which was a lie. You know, because there were about seven hundred by this stage, weren't there? Well, there were seven hundred prosecutions, but there were more than yeah. two thousand people who were sacked and suspended. Yeah. Um, and, and many thousands more who were required to pay money back into holes in their accounts, which they did and kept their jobs as a result. So, you know, we won't even know how much money sub postmasters have put from their own pockets into their accounts. I mean, the, the horizon system was so shonky that, and the, the contract situation was so bad and the auditing procedures within the post office were so inept that sub postmasters were contractually allowed to keep their surpluses. So if post office A one week gets an inexplicable £1,000 surplus and post office B gets an inexplicable £1,000 deficit. Post Office A keeps their surplus and says no more about it. They don't even need to report it. Post Office B, which you know may have been some sort of computer error that sends the money to the wrong branch, has to make good that £1,000 out of their own pocket or potentially lose their jobs. So you had some postmasters losing money hand over fist, losing their savings, losing money from their retail business, their whole entire finances disappearing down a hole, being told that they're contractually responsible to keep their branches open and to keep filling the holes in their branch accounts, being told that they're the only ones having problems with this IT system, starting to doubt their 
partners, because they don't know whether they've got their hands in the till, starting to doubt their own minds, because they don't know, uh, you know, they were previously perfectly competent business people, and now their business is losing money, and they don't know why. And so they're in a, in a desperate situation. They say at the end of their weekly balancing, that their accounts are okay, hoping that one day, somehow, some money is going to come from somewhere back down the line, you know, the surplus will be found in the other branch and handed to them, or it will just be a mistake that will be written off, or they'll find the thief, or something will happen, and the madness will stop. But once you start signing off accounts, which don't bear any reality to the amount of cash and stock that you've actually got in your branch, you are creating a whole world of trouble for yourself. Mm. And the, the the balances, the misbalances and the discrepancies would escalate. And eventually they'd either put up their hands and say, I can't do this any longer. Or the post office would spot it at the back end and go, look, these people are holding an awful lot of cash in branch. They need to remit it back to post office central. And they'd say, right, you've got 25,000 pounds in the safe, send it back to us. At which point the postmaster would say, I don't have that 25,000 pounds. The auditors would come in. We're now looking at, you know, five figure sum of money. They'd be suspended on the spot without pay. Then very often they'd be sacked and then prosecuted for the crimes of theft and false accounting. And this is the second egregious thing that the post office did. Very, very often on the court steps, because postmasters would say, look, I'm not a thief. They, you know, this, this is all a terrible misunderstanding. You know, I might have been sort of pressing the wrong button that sort of, you know, was against the rules process wise, but I'm not a thief. And the post office would take them to court for theft and false accounting. And on the steps of the court, their legal people would say to the postmaster's barrister, okay, we'll drop the theft charge if they plead guilty to false accounting. And the advice that the sub postmasters got time and time again from the harassed criminal barrister that had spent 15 minutes looking at their case was, uh, whose job it is, you know, whose job it normally is to keep his clients out of jail, would be, look, they're gonna drop the theft charge if you plead guilty to false accounting. That is your best chance of staying out of prison. I advise you to plead guilty. And desperate sub postmasters, trusting people who believe in the British state, British brands, the system, you know, that, 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 that they were going to be done right by, are now faced with the prospect of not only having lost their livelihoods, their reputations, and all their money, but now they're going to go to prison. They decide the best thing that they can do is plead guilty to false accounting in order to stay out of prison. Otherwise, they're being advised that they're very, very likely to, to it go to prison. And, and get it is there. genuinely wicked and shocking. Um, and as we explained in our intro, the post office was, not anymore, but it was held in such high regard. But was there nobody inside the post office seeing all these cases coming to court, thinking, hang on a minute, are we sure about this bloody computer? Is there nobody kind of inside sending memos saying, there's so many of these cases, you know, is the software wrong do, do we need to look at our own systems or were they just completely messianic about it well, well, there was a desperate need for this computer system to be infallible because the entire post office business system relied on it if as became subsequently apparent it became known that the post office couldn't tell the difference between it error and fraud it was an existential threat to the entire business because it had bet the farm on the automation of wow. the post office. The footfall that was traditionally um, driving post, post, the post office business was uh, caused by uh, benefits claimants and pension recipients coming into the counter and receiving the cash over the counter. The government was moving towards putting pensions and benefits directly into people's bank accounts, which meant that the, there was going to be an obvious tail off in footfall for the post office and its raison d'etre was, was under threat. The Horizon computer system was going to give all sorts of uh, functionality to the retail offering that the post office could provide. It could sell holidays, it could sell insurance, it could sell, uh, it could allow retail banking, it could allow people to pay their uh, electricity and gas bills through the Horizon system. If anything got out that this system was not fit for purpose, all those clients, the BBC through the license fee uh, system, the DVLA through the tax discs and the electricity companies and the Bank of Ireland would just walk away. They, 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 so the post office had had to present the idea that this system was infallible to the world. And it also had to drink the Kool-Aid internally. And the prosecution of sub postmasters was business as usual. 
I mean, I, I spoke to a professor of fraud in uh, on the South Coast when I was making the original film for the BBC, and he said, "Don't forget, three hundred years ago, the post office used to hang its sub postmasters for oh offences. You know, they, they probably think they probably think that a mild prosecution for false accounting is letting <laughs> them off lightly. So, so business as usual was creating." convictions or creating convicts out of their staff. That's what the post office did. And so it wasn't queried too much by those at the top. It was only when the campaigners and the MPs started asking questions of the business in around 2010, that the very first internal introspection began. And uh, there was a report published in May 2010 called the Ismay Report by Rod Ismay who was a very senior person. It was sent to uh, the then managing director, the then head of criminal law within the post office, the then head of civil law within the post office and the head of uh, security who was responsible for uh, making decisions about prosecutions. And he stated in his report, it was a complete whitewash. He said, look, we've, we've asked Fujitsu if it's all right. Fujitsu tell us it's great. Uh, all these people are mistaken. And frankly, we need to be very, very careful that you know there aren't people jumping on the bandwagon here bashing Horizon. But he said in, in one of his final paragraphs, and let me be crystal clear, if we were to bring in independent investigators to have a proper look at this Horizon system, we would have to stop all our criminal prosecutions. We'd have to inform the appeal courts and we may have to revisit previous prosecutions. Now that, that to me is the biggest red flag that you can ever get. That is someone saying, we do not, you know, if, if we look at this too hard, we might find we've sent innocent people to prison and we wouldn't want that. And the, the terminology of his language was obviously taken on board by the, the senior management at the post office because they didn't uh, put together an independent investigation. And, and wow. I think that that is reprehensible because if I felt as a senior executive for one moment that my organisation might have been responsible for putting one innocent person in jail or giving them a criminal conviction, I would have been pulling up trees all over my organisation to find out whether or not that was true. Okay. And the best we, we, decided we to, it would carry on to fast business forward. as usual. You're, you're, you're too good an interviewee. <laughs> we need to fast forward because we've got like seven minutes left. And I, I, we had you in the story. Private and I were in the story. Uh, we, can we kind of get to the, the next stage, which I, maybe is the panorama, I don't know, uh, where things started finally to get better for these poor people? Well, the, the panorama was um, significant to me. It was a big deal for me. I'd been talking to them for some time through uh, a contact that Jane French had at Panorama. And uh, his name is Andy Head, the commission executive up in Northern Ireland. And he saw this as a potentially good story, but he you know, kept saying, come back to me when you've got something, come back to me when you've got something. And eventually some paperwork fell into my hands, which to me was incontrovertibly huge. And that formed the basis of the, uh, well, it certainly got the Panorama Commission. Um, this is 2015? Shortly afterwards, 2015? 2015, yeah. 2015. Shortly afterwards, I was able to get a hold of a, a whistleblower from Fujitsu who'd worked inside Fujitsu, basically corroborating everything that we suspected, which was that Horizon was an absolute disaster on wheels. And there was a team of people trying to just keep it, keep it, uh, functioning 24 seven by rewriting code, rewriting dodgy code, trying to fix code, trying to fix fixes that people had erroneously introduced into the system uh, to the detriment of sub postmasters very often. And the panorama went out in August, 2015. And I thought, well, something's gonna happen now and nothing did. Uh, and it was actually down to the sub postmasters themselves. Alan Bates from the Justice for Sub Postmasters Alliance uh, managed to find the funding to get a group litigation together to take the post office to the high court. And after a, a legal battle, which lasted years and involved two incredibly attritional trials, during which the post office uh, said that it was its strategy was just to run the claimants out of money. Uh, it, because it, you know, even if it didn't have a case, it, it always had the firepower to, 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 to bury them. Um, you know, to the extent that the post office tried to get the managing judge removed from from the litigation when he produced a judgment that they didn't like and you know, at more expense to the claimants. Uh, eventually the sub-postmasters won, hands down, post office settled, uh, gave them 57.75 million pounds, 46 million of which was swallowed up in funders and legal fees. And everything unraveled from those December 2019 judgments, um, which opened the door for the Criminal Cases Review Commission to refer so many convictions back to the Court of Appeal. It uh, opened the door for the, the public inquiry, which is currently ongoing. And so it was um, it, it was fascinating to be able to report everything that was going on during that. And it was March 2019 was the big change in the campaign. And, and Alan Bates had been campaigning since he was sacked in 2003. 
But March 2019 was the first time that anyone in authority has said these postmasters have a case and the way that they've been treated is reprehensible. And, uh, and even so they were all by this stage, down. they were all released from prison. Everybody was out by now. The, the sentences were relatively, I mean, say relatively short. I wouldn't want to go to prison for one day. But but um, I think the, the worst sentence that I've come across was three years. Um, poor chap got, got a three year prison sentence. He was out after 18 months. Um, so, so the, the the prison sentences that people got were were relatively short to 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 um, uh, you know what, what what we often hear about as, as making the news. But it was it was the sheer volume of people given criminal convictions, uh, pleading guilty to crimes they didn't commit, being sent to prison for crimes they didn't commit o over such a long period of time that makes this such a, a stain on the history of, of this country, frankly. It's not just the post office. The government backed the post office's position throughout the, the group litigation, signed off the, the millions of pounds needed to try and bury this miscarriage of justice in the hope it never saw the light of day. And has anyone been held to account for this? <laughs> no. No, no. I mean, that's the way our system works, isn't it? You know, who, who goes who goes to prison as a result of making decisions in bad faith in this country on this kind of scale? No one from the establishment, I think, will ever uh, be put in a, in a criminal court having to answer questions. I mean, I, I might be might be wrong on that. I know there is a, there's an ongoing police investigation called Operation Olympus, which started in January 2000 and was sparked by the managing judge in the civil litigation being so gravely concerned by some of the evidence that he'd seen from Fujitsu employees in the past that uh, he asked the director of public prosecutions to open investigation. He passed that file on to the Met. The Met have been sitting on it for more than three years now. And in that time, they've questioned two people under caution twice. Now, given how much evidence there is already in the public domain of not just decisions made in bad faith, but, you know, the head of security at the post office ordering the shredding of documents in relation to problems with the Horizon IT system back in 2013. That is evidence that exists in the public domain already. The fact that the police don't seem to have found uh, uh, the wherewithal or, or what they consider something enough to be uh, a case against anyone. Uh, in this scandal suggests that no one will be held accountable for this because just that's the way the British do things. And your book had no impact because I mean, you know, it's been very widely, well, very well reviewed. I mean, did that change things? And did your problems getting publishers to take on the story? Were they worried? Yeah, the, the, I, I start after the panorama, I thought, right, now's the time to write the book, um, particularly because I, I had a whiff of this court case coming. So I thought, well, if I write up the history of this scandal, um, then the court case can provide the last few chapters. And whilst I was writing it, I was obviously looking for a publisher and no one would touch it. The legal insurance on it was, was way, way too much. And Bath Publishing, who put the book out simply because they'd been following the story in private eye for all these years, mm -hmm. and a chance meeting uh, led to me asking if they'd consider publishing. And, and David Chaplin, the, who runs Bath Publishing, just said, oh yeah, I've been reading about that in private eye for years. It's a scandal. Let's do something. So they, they basically put the book out without any legal insurance on it. And we just had to hope that um, we'd got everything right. And I'm quite pleased to say that uh, obviously huge amounts of information has come out in the subsequent inquiry. And I don't think there's anything that I've got in the book that's wrong so far. Amazing. What about, and we literally only have a minute left. I'd love to know what happened to, was it Seema Mistra, the woman who was in prison, whose husband first contacted you? Well, Seema and Davina have become great friends. I mean, they live very, very close to me. And uh, over the years, we've got to know each other really well. Oh, that's, God. The only, that's the only fans version. Sorry, we've just had a little break. As, 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 as familiar, loyal viewers and listeners will know, we're doing this on software that's even worse than the post offices um, <laughs> <laughs> that caused this scandal. Uh, so I'm sorry we had to lose you for a second. But you were just explaining, I think, what happened to the couple that originally contacted you. And I would really love to know if they had some kind of happy ending. Because uh, I think well, one of the great strengths of the book are the human stories that you make this. It's not just about technology. It's about the impact on people's lives. Yeah, it was a, it was a struggle to um, get the balance with that right because you can get compassion fatigue. You can hear another story about another sub postmaster in a very very similar situation. I mean, that's that's the thing about this that the patterns that that arose over the course of these seven hundred prosecutions, the uh, the the bait and switch that the post office used to. Um, try and accuse someone of fraud and then uh, sorry accuse someone of theft and then drop the theft charge in exchange for a, a, a false accounting plea all these tactics telling them that they were the only ones it, it, if i sort of just started to repeat each 
personal story it might might be quite wearing for the reader and, and you can get compassion fatigue sometimes so i tried to draw out the unique elements of each story as i introduced a new uh sub postmaster to each element of, of the scandal and and whilst also not losing sight of the narrative and, and, the, and the chronology of it which is sometimes all over the place because you have people things happening to people a long long time ago and then sort of relatively recent developments so it was um but it was important, yes, to get those those personal stories in because I think that's when they they begin to hit home and you start to hear their their voices coming out and and, and their experience of what happened. And, to and them. see, see one of the shocking Sorry, things we just we didn't get what happened to Seema because I think we didn't record Sorry. it the last time. And I would love to know. Okay, so should, should we pick up? All right, pick up. Um, well, I'm delighted to say that over the years, Seema and Davinda have become friends. They live quite close to me, and um, Seema very nearly lost her baby in prison and was released early as a result. She was suicidal as well, and her health was deteriorating significantly. But thankfully, she did have a, a very healthy baby boy who is now, I think, 12 years old. She's also got her eldest son. She was sent to prison on her son's 10th birthday. And for uh, that entire period, his, his father was telling him that, that her mother was in hospital and, and he was kept in the dark as to what was going on pretty much until her conviction was quashed in 2021. Um, but now he's he's an adult in his own right and he fully understands uh, now, well, at least is, is informed as to what his parents went through. And they're a very tight knit family. They've survived as a couple and as a relationship, it hasn't broken down. They're both um, quite mentally strong and, and, and they've got faith in their Hindu religion, which they say has, has basically kept them alive and kept them together throughout because they came to this country uh, believing in, believing in the British Empire, believing in in what Britain stood for, that they would get on in the world, that, that if they worked hard, things would come good. And I mean, Devinder told me once, you know, he said, I'm Indian, I like to show off. I would tell tell my friends back uh, back in India that, hey, now I was running a post office and, uh, you know, a lot, you know, the, I had a part of the British state that was endorsing who I was. I was a proud man. And then to see that taken away from him and to mm. see his reputation traduced and, and his wife go to prison was was something that they tried to hide from their relatives back in India. And, and it absolutely destroyed them. Um, and, and I'm delighted to say that, you know, there were times when Devinder talked to me about having to buy a supermarket bag of catering pack of rice and, and, and portion the meals out over the course of a week and, and, and go hungry herself to make sure that her kids had enough to eat. And that wasn't that long ago. And now they've got some compensation and now her conviction's been quashed and now she's been able to get a job for the first time in over a decade. Oh, so and they are that. rebuilding their lives to the point where they they are, I wouldn't call, I wouldn't say they're happy. I mean, they're still so angry about what happened to them, but they're very strong and tight knit. And, you know, when I see them, it is all smiles and, and they are they, they they are coming through this. Well, I think what you've done is Is it shaking amazing. your faith? Sorry. Can I, I, well, I, I Sorry, Andrew, yeah. Has it shaken your faith, Nick, in the system? I mean, you saw time and time yeah. again, you know, yeah. people lying, covering up, uh, pursuing oh, completely. people. Well, knew. I mean, as, as as a journalist, you expect that people will always take the path of least resistance and that if that, you know, if that involves keeping your job, keeping your head down, not asking too many questions, you expect that to happen. You also expect there to be corrupt and lazy individuals in any corporation, in any walk of life. So that hasn't really shaken my faith. In fact, I have met people far more shocked by what went on than I am because they come from professions where professionalism and expertise and, and uh, a sense of uh, moral uh, compass is, is, is expected of them. Whereas we work in journalism, we know that, that people are useless, lazy, mendacious and, and, and dissembling given half the chance. What has shaken my faith? in this entire um, establishment or the system that we work within is the, the point at which people at the very highest level knew something was going wrong. And it was proved as having gone wrong, i.e. a high court judge in two 300 page judgments pointed out exactly where things had gone wrong. That even after that, there was dissembling on all sides about the effect of this scandal, how people should be compensated and who should be held to account. Setting aside the fact that no one will be held to account for this as far as I can see the, the way these things are going and based on historical precedent for other scandals. The people who were ruined by this, and there are hundreds of them all around the country, hardworking people who put their faith in the system, who have now been proved right 
in a court of law that they were innocent, they didn't do anything wrong, and they were badly put upon, not just by the post office, but by the government and the criminal justice system. These people should be instantly receiving large volumes of money to compensate them for what they went through. And even now, there is constant foot dragging as to how much that compensation should be, the hoops they should have to jump through to get to it, the way the compensation schemes are set up, the sclerotic nature uh, of the movement within the government and the post office to, to do the right thing and put these people even close back to where they were financially before this scandal hit them. That's what's really, really shaken my faith in the system because they have all the documentary evidence that they need to prove that they were the victims of a massive miscarriage of justice. And I spoke to someone whose conviction was quashed in December 2020, and he has not yet received any compensation from the post office or the government for what happened to him. Um, he is an outlying case, but there are many other cases like it. I spoke to someone in January who is fighting on the behalf of his 70 year old father, who has, because he was bankrupt, was considered a complex case. And despite applying for compensation in 2020, has not yet received anything like he should. Uh, and this is despite years and years of fighting. And I'm detecting this, this weariness amongst the sub postmasters. They're, they're so sick of fighting. They've now won. They've now been proved right. And yet they are still not getting the compensation. I spoke to one postmaster yesterday whose husband was convicted in 2001. She wants to know why she has to pay or she has to apply to get the government to pay £13,500 to a bunch of forensic accountants to work for six weeks to go through all their paperwork, which they've already produced on several occasions for several compensation schemes and for the court case in the first place in order to get a step closer to the compensation that they need. Now, she's relatively young. We know that at least 30 people have died waiting for compensation. And I can't help but think that that's in the government's interests. The longer they drag this out, the longer the post office drag this out, the longer the lawyers keep making money from this, the more people will die and the less compensation will have to be paid. And that's that's what's shaken my faith in the system. So who are the villains? I mean, do MPs not emerge very well, government departments, the courts, apart well, from the, I, the, the I, management? Well, I, I have to say that the, the, if it weren't for the backbench MPs jumping up and down on behalf of their constituents, it's very unlikely this scandal will have seen the light of day. People like James Arbuthnot, uh, Kevin Jones, J uh, uh, um, uh, David Davis, an, a number of backbench MPs held the government's feet to the fire over this over a period of years. The government was um, staffed by a sort of rotating revolving door of junior ministers. Uh, who were responsible for the post office in name, but who were being advised by the post office and advised by their own civil servants who were actively involved in trying to cover up this scandal. And it was only really when Paul Scully, the um, last postal minister, but one uh, who was it, by that stage in, in possession of um, the two high court judgments and the, the, the Criminal Cases Review Commission's report, it was only when he got uh, his his department's head round the the need to start compensating people and the need to start inquiring into what went wrong, that any um, movement from government in favour of sub postmasters started to happen. I think that I think the real villains of this are, are manifold. You've got the the unthinking prosecutors within the post office who just assumed guilt on behalf of the sub postmasters. The uh, appalling tactics of the post office investigation unit run uh, in their security department in terms of trying to extract confessions from people about false accounting and, and making decisions to um, tell people that they were the only ones having problems with the IT system. You've got Fujitsu, who was constantly pulling the wool over the post office's eyes as to how bad the system was, uh, giving it false reassurance that it was functioning when it wasn't, and providing witness statements and expert witnesses to say that in court during the prosecutions of sub postmasters. You've got the senior executives in the post office for whom um, this was a potential problem that just would not go away, uh, and, and they tried to hush up as much as possible. Their job, as they saw it, was to make the post office profitable and anything that got in its way um, was something that should be minimised uh, rather than looked into properly. And I think Paula Venels will have questions to, to answer about that, the, the chief executive, the former chief executive of the post office when she gives evidence in the statutory inquiry. And but I think the most mendacious so of all... Sorry. I, I, well, she don't forget, she, her boss, her boss was the government and there were civil servants within the government who were helping her 
uh, try and minimise this problem, despite the fact they knew they were sitting on potential miscarriages of justice. Mm. And finally, you have the criminal justice system. You have the lawyers who were advising the post office and you have the um, defence teams and the, the judges themselves who were ex essentially accepting uh, what the post office's assurances about the efficacy of this IT system in complete ignorance, complete ignorance. Uh, that it was working or not in order to convict uh, these, these helpless people. So, um, you know, it, it's a systematic failure, but that doesn't mean individuals shouldn't be held to account. Okay, and where do we, we go are going to lose you again. Sorry, Andrew. Uh, we're, <laughs> <laughs> we're doing our normal thing. We're going to lose you once more. Can I just thank you? Um, really, you're a credit to our profession. It's amazing what you've done. Um, and, um, you know, I also like to mention my friend John Sweeney. I think was partly responsible for the panorama. John was brilliant. Jo John was brought on board for the first panorama in 2015. I sat down over a couple of beers with him and explained the story. He immediately got what was good, happening. Good. No, uh, he a, brought his own skills to bear ones. on it. He's one of the good ones, and yeah. so are you. And thank you for, for, for sharing this amazing story with us and for all and you I, doing. Good I luck think we should come continue. back to it. We should you know, come back see to how it. things go and get a, an update. We should. Well, this, the inquiry is, is is rumbling on for the rest of this year and should report early next year. So maybe after we get the inquiry report, which will hopefully start naming names and pointing fingers, we may see whether or not the police actually decide to charge anyone. That might be a good time to have a chat. That really would. That would be great. For the Look moment, thank you it. again. Thanks okay. so much, guys. It's been I a pleasure really, to, to come really on this. Appreciate I do appreciate it. it. Thanks a lot. Bye. Thank you for listening to the Scandalmongers podcast. This has been a podcast world production. You can get in contact with our show by emailing team at podcastworld.org, placing Scandalmongers in the heading, or via our social media links within the show's bio.